Well, good morning, everyone. We are in this epic journey together through the Bible, one book at a time, book by book. So if you do have a Bible, why don't you turn to Nehemiah with me? That's where we're going to be, as we've heard. Let me start this morning by asking you a question. How do you cope in a crisis? So when something goes wrong, when things turn ugly, when someone needs to step up to save the day, how do you respond? Are you the type of person who panics, running around like a headless chicken, trying to, solve, trying to sort out the problems? Or are you someone who can remain really cool, really calm, really composed and measured? Do you try, jump into action, try and save the day, or do you call for somebody else to come and help you? Big shout out to our youth today who are in with us for the preach. Great to have you. Right now, it might feel like with the exam season that it's like a crisis moment. Are you the type of person who like revises crams last minute or do you like walk in really cool to the exam hall? Do you worry about the questions? Maybe you feel like you're in a crisis right now. But I wonder, does anything stick out in your mind as a memory of when you've had to face a crisis? One particular story in my life stands out. So before Carol and I, Caroline and I were married, we were driving back, having been in the Midlands, we were driving back up to Liverpool on the motorway together, and the quirks of my car that I had at that time were that every now and again, the petrol gauge would sort of jerk down and jump down, and suddenly you'd think, oh, I don't quite have as much petrol as I thought I did. And perhaps the worst instance of that happening was this time when we were on the motorway, and suddenly where I thought I had maybe half a tank of petrol, it went down to like zero, and the light came on, and it was like panic stations. And I thought, oh, okay, bit tense now, but maybe we can get to the next services, and I'll be okay and get some petrol. But the moment came where I had my foot on the accelerator of the car, and the car just wasn't responding, not doing anything. And I started slowly decelerating, getting slower and slower, thinking, oh dear, this is getting a bit, a bit hairy in this moment. So I managed to get my way over to the left-hand lane, get into the hard shoulder. Luckily, there was one, and the car came to a a stop. And I thought, oh, okay, this is something of a crisis. Now, I'd love to say that I was able to remain really calm, really composed, maybe call someone for help, maybe check my breakdown cover. What a good idea that would have been. No, I was like headless chicken panicking, not knowing what to do at all. And the best idea I could come up with was, okay, Caroline, you sit in the driver's seat, And I don't know when the next services are, but I'm going to get out and push the car. (laughs) Maybe it's only a few miles and that'll be fine and I'll be able to show you that, you know, I hope to marry you one day, I'll be able to show that I'm pretty strong. But all I revealed was, in fact, my glaring weakness. I managed to maybe push the car half a metre before Caroline told me I was being a Muppet, get back in the car. I did not cope well in a crisis. At this point in the whole Bible story, we we find ourselves at a bit of a crisis point. So the book of Nehemiah is actually chronologically, these are the last events of the Old Testament. And at chapter 1, we find ourselves at a crisis point, a low point. Nehemiah 1.3 says this, Things are not going well. Things are not going well for those who've returned to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem, the walls of the city, they've been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Here's the context. So in 587 BC, the people, God's people in Jerusalem are deported by a guy called Nebuchadnezzar. They're taken into exile into a place called Babylon. So they're foreigners exiled into a foreign land and their city is destroyed. 40 years after that, Another group, the Persians, they defeat the Babylonians. And they say, we think God's people, the Jews, we think they should be able to go back to their land and worship their God. But a hundred years after that, we still see many Jews are not in their homeland. They're still foreigners and their city is still in ruins. And many of God's people, they're actually still in this place called Persia. That's where we find ourselves at the start of Nehemiah. And their city is still in ruins. In of itself, that's a tragedy, isn't it? When we see footage on the news of war-torn countries with buildings and rubble on the floor. That's a, it's a tragedy. It's devastating, isn't it? But at this point of the story, Jerusalem, this isn't just a city. It's not just a place where people have lived and have suffered a bit. This is God's dwelling place. This is the joy of the whole earth, the Bible says. Glorious things of you are spoken, O Zion, O city of God. All our springs are in you. This is a It's a theological crisis as well as a humanitarian crisis. The the temple in Jerusalem, that's the dwelling place of God on earth. It's where God's presence and his power and his favour are known on earth. Nehemiah's story begins with the dwelling place of God dilapidated and in ruins and in need of urgent repair. That's a crisis point. 
But actually, the reality of the world that we live in is that we too can find ourselves in amidst somewhat of multiple crises points. Inflation, food insecurity, soaring energy and food prices, supply chain disruptions, mounting debt, they're all among the problems that are being added to a world still recovering from the human and the economic losses of COVID. We're facing climate change, multiple war outbreaks. Globally and more locally, we find ourselves just in need as ever of a saving, redemptive, restorative, forgiving God as any snapshot in history. So today I, I have three points to make from Nehemiah's chapter one to three about how Nehemiah responds in a crisis. My hope is that we can see how that actually they can apply to us when we find ourselves at crisis point. But ultimately, and most importantly, Nehemiah points us forwards towards Jesus as the one who comes to redeem the greatest crisis of all. Okay, that's where we're headed. So how does Nehemiah respond in a crisis? First of all, Nehemiah prays. Nehemiah prays. Chapter 1, verse 4, Nehemiah says this, When I heard this, that's the news of the city in ruins, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. So with the city in ruins, Nehemiah starts in weeping in prayer and in fasting. Maybe this is a comfort for some of you when you were reflecting a moment ago on how do I respond in a crisis? Maybe all you want to do is break down and cry in tears, just pour out your emotions. That's how we find Nehemiah here. We find him weeping in tears and in prayer. So before moving into action, Nehemiah begins with prayer. What might that mean for us? What might it mean for you in your situation? Do you notice it's, it's prayer as a first line of defence, not as a last resort. It's praying not when there's nothing left that we can do, but before we've done anything at all. How instinctively and how quickly do you turn to pray in a crisis? But also, what can we learn from what what does Nehemiah pray and how does Nehemiah pray? Perhaps your struggle this morning might not be understanding that, yeah, prayer is important, we should pray. But it might be understanding, well, how should I pray? What what do I pray? What, What should I say? Well, firstly, Nehemiah's prayer is fueled by his emotions. He weeps. For whatever reason, it could be any number of reasons, we can often fall into a trap of misunderstanding the means by which we can come to pray. We can think far too much about the posture we're meant to carry or the impressive words we're meant to say. Or we go into a very sort of solemn, stoic mindset. We've got to, we've got to hold it together. We couldn't possibly embarrass ourselves by showing our emotions to God. We've got to hold it together. No, it's ridiculous. Nehemiah's prayer is fueled by his emotions. He sits down and he weeps and he prays. When was the last time you wept in prayer? When was the last time you brought yourself with all of the emotional baggage you were carrying to God and expressed that to him in prayer? Philippians 4, it says, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Well, how else does he pray? Nehemiah remembers who God is. Verse 5 says, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. How often, when we're in a crisis, when we've got problems, can we fixate all of our attention and all of our energy on the problem itself? No, first we remember who God is. We shift our perspective. We focus not on the problem that we face, but the God who is able and sovereign to overcome all problems. How else does Nehemiah pray? He he repents. To repent means to turn away from sin, to turn towards God. Verse 7 says, We've sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you've given us through Moses. He recognizes and acknowledges the sin of the people. And to repent means to turn towards the will of God for your life. Perhaps that might be where you're at today. If you feel like your life is a crisis point. Maybe your prayer response that we'll come to in a bit is one of turning away from sin and turning towards God. There'll be a chance to do that a bit later. So how does Nehemiah respond in a crisis? First of all, Nehemiah prays. He brings himself emotionally, he remembers who God is, and he repents, he prays. Secondly, how else does Nehemiah respond in a crisis? Nehemiah gave up everything to serve. He gave up everything to serve. When he's faced with this crisis, Nehemiah discarded and gave up his privilege, his position, his power, and he actually risked his life. Why? To serve. 
to obey God. So after praying for four months, Nehemiah approaches the king of Persia to petition for God's people. So it says this, chapter 2 now, verse 1. Early the following spring, in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then, Nehemiah says, I was terrified. So despite being a Jew, an outsider in a foreign land, Nehemiah actually is in the, he's got the confidence of the king as the cupbearer to the king. He's often in the presence of the king. And he actually risks his life in the conversation that we just read. By approaching the king without prior authorization, he's risking his life. And it says he's terrified. So under Persian law, the king had the right to execute anyone who petitioned him without prior authorization. It's a spoiler for next week, but it's the same story with Esther. Even as a queen, when she tries to approach the king without authorization, says this, all the king's officials, even the people in the provinces, know that anyone who appears before the king without being invited is doomed to die. So not only this, but Nehemiah is approaching the king, but he's also asking the king to undo a decision that he previously made. So back in the book of Ezra, the king said, no, the Jews aren't to return to their, their land. But now he's going, approaching the king without authorization and asking him to change his mind. So like Esther, Nehemiah was willing to sacrifice everything to serve God's people. Because even if the king didn't kill him, he was still willing to give up the comfort of his life, of his prestigious job. It's a bit of a trend that we can see through the Bible, actually, of sacrificial service to God. Remember Moses earlier in the Bible story? Moses gave up his life of privilege in Pharaoh's house. Why? To serve and lead God's people. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he gave up his position, his reputation, his influence to serve Jesus. Or Jesus, the best example of all, laid aside the grandeur and majesty and perfection of heaven and humbled himself to die a death to save mankind. Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God as something to be grasped. Instead, he emptied himself. Jesus says, if anyone wants to follow me, must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. What do you value? Is it the comfort of position, prestige, power, a comfortable lifestyle, a job, wealth, your bank balance, relationships? Or does your heart break for the purposes of God? So therefore, everything other than that becomes secondary. Use what you have, your gifts, your talents, for his glory, not your own. Understand that every good thing in your life is a gift from him. What are you using all that God's given you for? There's a quote from a friend of mine and a a church leader, actually, that I've never forgotten and I hope I never do. He said this, Serving is not a stepping stone to greatness, Serving is greatness itself. So again, serving isn't a stepping stone to greatness. It's greatness itself. In our performance-driven, promotion-striving, acknowledgement-obsessed culture, we often don't get this. And it can actually impact how we serve and serve in church. You might serve on a a team or on a rotor or on on a church team for any number of reasons. Play your part, be part of a team, sense of duty, diligence. Actually, sometimes what can be under the surface is... I hope when I'm serving this morning, I hope somebody notices me. I hope I get acknowledged. I hope somebody thanks me for what I've done. I, I hope I get seen. Because maybe then I might, I'm serving on this team, maybe then I might get a bit of a promotion, I might become a sort of leader of a team. And then maybe after that I might be promoted to a, a more impressive team or a, a team that looks a bit shinier and more glitzy for me. No, serving isn't a stepping stone towards anything. It's not a stepping stone towards greatness. Serving is greatness itself. Jesus came to earth not to be served, but to serve. By listening to our children this morning, by listening to Andy with his call to serve on our kids' team and responding by going and signing up this morning, that's imitating Christ. It's greatness itself. Don't sit on the edge of church life with wasted capacity and talent and gifts because you come on a Sunday to be served. No, instead choose to sacrificially give yourself to serve God and serve others. So Nehemiah, he gave up everything to serve. Thirdly and finally, Nehemiah led everyone to play their part. Nehemiah chapter 3 is one of those chapters in the Bible that can feel pretty challenging to read. 
So in our Bible reading plan that we've got this week, it's actually no surprise that on Tuesday, we're doing Nehemiah chapter 2. Wednesday, we're jumping to Nehemiah chapter 4. We're just not doing Nehemiah 3. It's one of those that sort of just reads as a bit of a list of names. But Nehemiah chapter 3, we see some evidence of the huge amount of planning and organisation that goes into the rebuilding of the walls of the city. One key phrase that's repeated about 20 times, which I love, is this, it'll list someone and what they did in the wall, and then it says, next to them was this person. Next to them, this person. Alongside them, this person. And it goes on and on and on. Having someone next to you as you serve, as you work, what an encouragement for us, that we don't struggle and strive alone, that we're in teams. And also, these builders that are listed, they're not professional builders, These were people of all occupations, all backgrounds, all encouraged by Nehemiah to take on this big rebuild. Volunteers serving and honouring God. I was struck by that fact. There's no professional builders, no professional carpenters. Instead, what do we see? In verse 8 of chapter 3, we see perfumers. Verse 8, verse 31, we see goldsmiths. Later on, we see temple servants, merchants, the high priests and the priests and loads of other leaders. So no one's too important, too much of a big deal to get their hands dirty and get stuck in. An official, verse 12, we read an official was building with his daughter. Men, women working alongside one another. Young, old, multi-generational working alongside each other. Everyone valued, everyone mentioned. There's actually the leaders of the Tekoite people in verse 5. We read they actually didn't want to get their hands dirty. Having a leader who doesn't want to get involved might demotivate those people. But we read that the Tekoite people got stuck in, played their part, actually rebuilt another part of the wall as well. They went on to do some extra work. Nehemiah had so marvelously organized and planned the work that everyone had a section of the wall or a gate assigned to them. The important truth is this, that this is God's design for how he will bring about his kingdom and how he will build his church. Speaking to our kids team in preparation for today, I loved hearing loads of stories of how God is at work in our children's lives. And one particular highlight was the story of a boy in primary kids sharing his faith at school. So talking to his friend on the playground about God, about the Bible, about church that he'd been to the previous day. And then really bravely, really courageously, he invited that friend to come along to church. That friend came along, loved primary kids, and is now on their journey of discovering Jesus for themselves. Firstly, let's be inspired for a moment by the bravery and the faith of that child in primary kids to invite his friend. But secondly, just think for a moment, if that friend comes to put their trust in Jesus, who, who is responsible Well, first and foremost, God is responsible. God is the one who saves. Salvation belongs to God. It's all a gift of his grace. But also, who else is responsible? Well, the the boy for sharing his faith, for being brave, for making that invitation. Anyone else responsible? Yeah, let me put it to you. 16 team members every Sunday who get up early, sacrifice their Sunday lion. They sacrifice their right to come along and be served. Why? To serve our children to give them a warm welcome, to teach them the Bible, that they have fun together. They have a part to play in that friend coming to know Jesus. If we respond this morning by joining a team and playing our part and bringing what we have to serve God, it actually, as Andy was saying, can have eternal implications and impact. God has placed us all strategically where we are to play our part. He's given you the gifts to do it. And actually, as we reflect back on these three points I've made this morning, we can actually see as well how they point us towards the truth of an even greater Nehemiah. They point us towards Jesus, who is the one who saves. Jesus, whose whose rebuild and restoration of our lives, it's not temporary, but it's eternal. By the end of the book of Nehemiah, this building project, that people have already started to mess up and get it wrong. But Jesus, his rebuilding of our lives has eternal impact. So Nehemiah prayed in a crisis, Jesus prays. The writers of the Hebrews explains that in Jesus, we have a great high priest in heaven, interceding, means praying for us before the Father. Just as Nehemiah stood in the gap and approached the king and petitioned the king for God's people, Jesus, in Jesus, we do not have a high priest, it says in Hebrews, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus has empathy. Jesus feels emotionally and prays on behalf of us. 
Nehemiah gave up everything to serve. As I've already said, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve, to lay down his life in the most beautiful example of sacrificial service, service we could ever know. And finally, Jesus is the one who will build his church. We get to play our part by bringing what we have, our service, to him. But it's Jesus' church, and he will build it, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm going to come to sing in a moment in response. I just want to offer you two chances to respond this morning. First of all, if you felt this morning a prompting in your heart, in your spirit, just right through as we were listening to children earlier, as we've been worshipping, if you felt a prompting to play your part, to get off the sidelines and get stuck in, as we sing in a moment, just encourage you to use the words of this song as a declaration as a statement of intent. God, I'm not going to live on the, on the periphery, on the sidelines. I'm not going to spectate. I want to play my part in what you're building. And go to reception at the end of the meeting, as Andy said. Sometimes, I don't know if you're like me, sometimes you can think, yeah, I'll, I'll sit on that for a week. Maybe I'll think about it. Now, let me encourage you. If, this, if God is speaking to you right now, act upon that this morning. Make this morning a moment where you act and you do something. And secondly, just we're going to come sing in a moment. Should we stand together? It's just a second response that I just want to highlight for anyone in the room who might be newer to church, who might not yet know Jesus, and you might identify with your life feeling as though it's a crisis point. You might feel like the walls of your life are crumbling around you and you can spend your life trying to pick up the rubble and stick it all back together and get it all back in place. But realise desperately you need help. What we need is not to try and patch things up ourselves, but for God to come in and lift us out of the mess that we find ourselves in and to give us a new life where the old has gone and the new has come. Just in the context of this next song as we sing together, if that's you and you know this morning is a morning that I want to come to know Jesus, I want to build my life on him, just encourage you to be really brave. Just come down to the front. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to speak to you. Let me just pray. We're going to worship in a moment. Jesus, thank you that you are the amazing example of our high priest in heaven praying for us, interceding for us. Thank you that you are fully God, but didn't count equality with God, something to be grasped, but you emptied yourself, came to earth, died the death that we deserved and rose again in victory. And thank you that you will build your church, that nothing can come against it. And we want to lift our eyes to you right now, Jesus, and worship you for who you are. Amen. Let's sing together.